Are we ready? Everyone ready? Okay, good. <laughs> so we can continue. And um, <coughs> what we're going to do now is we're going to move on to some of the suttas that describe the Buddha's awakening and his path to awakening in quite a bit of detail. And these are, there's a number of suttas like this in the Pali Canon. There's about four altogether. And you will see here, if you go to page 20 uh, on this little booklet, uh, you can see I've added three suttas together, Majjhimanikai 26, 36 and 85, because they are very <coughs> They're very similar in many ways, but they also have slightly different information in them. So I kind of put it together into one continuous narrative, one continuous story. Uh, and that is the idea uh, behind this. Uh. So now we're going to see the background. We're going to have a look at what motivated uh, the Buddha to be, to become, to renounce the household life, to become a monk, basically. Because one of the things that is clear from the suit is the Buddha also was a monk. Yeah, He shaved his head, he put on uh, the ochre robes, just like monks were using. Yeah. What was the motivation? And then what was, the, uh, what was it that actually made him become a Buddha in the end? What is that path that we're looking for? How did the Buddha practice this? Uh, and it's all very, I don't know, very interesting in my opinion. Uh, and very, also very inspiring the way uh, the Buddha-to-be went about this whole thing here. Yeah. So this is from the uh, Arya Pariyasana Sutta. This Sutta has also a parallel in the uh, Chinese Agamas, the Madhyama Agama, the, uh, which is, comes from the Sarvastivadin lineage, so the different school of Buddhism. And it's quite interesting to compare these suttas. Uh, what is interesting about some of these other suttas, like uh, uh, Majjhima Nikaya 36, which is called the Maha Satchika Sutta, the Greater Discourse to Satchika, it does not have a parallel in the uh, Chinese Agamas. Uh, and the question is, why is that the case? Does that mean that this sutta only exists in Pali, didn't exist in any of the other schools? Uh, and actually it doesn't mean that, uh, because the, uh, what is interesting about the Chinese Agamas, does, does it, do, do most of you know something about the Chinese Agamas? Yeah, okay. Well, you know <laughs> quite a bit about Chinese Agamas. <laughs> a little bit. Can you have you read them? Have you have you been? Can you read them? Ah, okay. You did this. Okay, you're just like me. You can't read. You wish you wish you knew how to read Chinese, but you can't do it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the the interesting thing about the Chinese Agamas is that they have the uh, uh, Dirga Agama, which is same as the Diga Nikaya in the Pali. They have the Madhyama Agama, which is same as the Majjhima in the Pali. This is. Uh, Sanskrit terms versus Pali terms. Yeah, you have the uh, Sangyukt Agama huh, versus the Sangyut Sangyutta Sangyutta Nikaya in the Pali, and then they have the Ekotarika Agama uh, uh, versus the Anguttara Nikaya in the Pali. So they all have all the four collections there in the Chinese Agamas, uh, but they come from different schools. Uh. Yeah, this is what complicates the matter, because the Agamas, they were collected in China. These were the famous, some of these were the very famous Chinese monks who went to in India to collect Agamas. Xuanzang, Xuanzang, I, I cannot pronounce it properly, I, I apologize, <laughs> something like that. And it wasn't actually him, this was before him, because he, he only operated in about the 6th and 7th century, century, I think. Long before that, there were other monks, and these monks often came to China from Central Asia. These were Central Asian monks uh, in what today is the, you know, Uzbekistan and, and this Afghanistan and these countries. The, all of these countries were Buddhist in the old days. Uh, it's quite astonishing. All that, the whole area was Buddhist. Uh, the Silk Road going into China, all of that was Buddhist area. Uh, and I know that uh, Dr. Victor Wee, uh, he uh, led on a pilgrimage to that area a couple few years ago. Yeah, a couple two or three years ago. Did anyone here go on that uh, on that thing? You went. Okay, was it good? Was it interesting? Yeah. Okay, there you are. So these are interesting. It's like going back in history and seeing the historical evolution, how Buddhism kind of travelled across large parts of Asia in this way. Very interesting. Yeah. And uh, so uh, anyway, so. Um, it was collected by different monks, and because different monks would often come from different schools. Remember, the Sarvastivadins, they were all established in the north 
uh, of India, yeah, in what is now uh, Kashmir, what is now uh, Gandharan area. Dharmaguptakas were also established in Gandhara mostly. So because they were established in the north of India, they were the ones that were mo most naturally to go to China, because they were reasonably close. If you were in Sri Lanka, you were too far away, unless you went by boat maybe, but very far away from China. So these were the ones, and they would follow the caravans, because already in those days they had traders that traded on the Silk Route. Uh, and they would go with these traders very often, and go into China as a consequence. Uh, so because of that, the canon that went to China is not as unified as the Pali canon. Uh, it is more piecemeal, depending on which monks, perhaps some nuns as well, yeah, went into China and brought these things with them. Uh, uh, so the... Uh, Sangyukta Agama and the Madhyama Agama, these are from the Sarvastivadin school. The Dirga Agama is from the Dharmaguptaka school. Yeah? And the Enkotarika Agama, nobody knows which school it's from. We don't even know the school because it is so, it's such a different kind of collection. It's very hard to trace it to any school at all. The majority scholarly opinion is that it's from the Mahasangika school. It seems to be the majority scholarly opinion, but nobody is really quite sure where it comes from. And it has also evolved after its original putting down. So it doesn't really have the same authenticity and origina originality as the Anguttara Nikaya in the Pali. It has evolved, it has certain Mahayana ideas and things infiltrated into the Ekotarika Agama. So this sh shows you, and, this, and what this means, uh, which is important to understand about this, is that the different schools, uh, they put the suttas in different collections. So, for example, the Sarvastivadins might have some suttas in the Dirga Agama, which the Dharmaguptakas had in the Madhyama Agama. You see what I mean? So they, they, they put the suttas, they may have had the same suttas, but they had the suttas in different collections. So what that means is that because they have the four collections uh, from different schools, it means that sometimes suttas that exist in the Pali may not have been transmitted to China because they didn't have a unified canon. It doesn't mean that those schools didn't have those suttas, it just means that they didn't get transmitted because of the lack of unity of that canon. I don't know if sure if what I'm saying makes any sense to you, if it is clear enough. <laughs> Sometimes you have to just think about it. Well, I can try to explain it again later on. It's not such an important point. The point is just that just because it is missing there doesn't mean that it is not original in the Pali. So we have to be careful with drawing the right conclusions from these things. So anyway, uh, and uh, what is interesting also about this is that the, uh, uh, later on in recent years uh, they have found a Sanskrit version of the Didik Agama that was found in Afghanistan. Uh, yeah, Afghanistan, sometimes you travel to Central Asia and some of these people who live there, they're mostly Muslims who live in Afghanistan uh, and they dig into the ground, maybe they're farming or something and as they dig into the ground they come across these urns, yeah, ancient urns. They pull them out and they kind of have these scrolls inside and they start reading, can't understand anything because it's in some kind of ancient language. So they think, oh, what is this? And then they kind of go down to the market and they sell these ancient scrolls into the market. And eventually it ends up in some kind of collection somewhere, some kind of, maybe some U Europeans, they, are kind of, they like to collect these kind of things. Yeah, that's, I don't know why, but they collect all this stuff. And so, so they end up, they go to these strange markets in Asia and they find these things and they buy them off the, in Asia and then they collect them in their in the cellar somewhere, in the kind of in the basement, in, <laughs> in a house somewhere in Europe, and they kind of sit there until one day they realize, actually, maybe there's something really interesting going on with this. Uh, one of these guys was actually a Norwegian guy, Norwegian, same nationality as me, uh, and he had all these scrolls. He didn't really know what they were, and one day the, the scholars from the university all said, well, these are actually very interesting. These are ancient scrolls going back 2,000 years. Uh, this became known as the Skoyen, Skoyen collection in Norway. Uh, and um, similar collections were found, uh, and then the scholars tried to bring them together, yeah? And sometimes the collectors are cooperative, other times they're really stubborn and don't want to cooperate. Uh. But anyway, <laughs> that's human beings, human beings for you. Huh? So, and what they found is that in this, an some of these ancient scriptures from Afghanistan, they actually found a version of the Dirg Agama huh, in Sanskrit. Huh? And this turns out to be a Sarvastivadin version. Huh? Yes, so this is the one that is missing in Chinese because the Chinese Dirg Agama is a Dharmaguptaka school. Huh? They found this there, and lo and behold, this sutta, Majjhima Nikai 36, is found there. 
Yeah? So if the Chinese had had a complete collection, uh, if the Dirga Agama had been Sarvastivadin as well, uh, then they, they too would have had that sutta. So it is because it is not unified, that is the reason why that sutta does not exist in Chinese translation. So this shows you some of the complexities of what is going on. Uh, all of this is kind of interesting. I don't know if you are interested in these things. I find it kind of fascinating, yeah, the history of these documents and everything. And if it doesn't interest you, that's okay. That's not really why we're here to look at these things. But uh, for those of you who are interested, I know some of you are interested in these things. Uh, I thought I'd just uh, explain a little bit. And please, uh, 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 Please ask questions about these things later on. Uh, if you either if you haven't understood or you would like to know some more, uh, you can kind of push my knowledge. I don't really know all that much about these things, but nobody nobody actually knows all that much because it's all quite obscure. Uh, people are still researching these things, uh, but um, uh, I think I will stop there, and then we can uh, get on with the suttas. So all of these suttas exist are ancient suttas, and they exist across uh, the various schools. Uh, so, um, this is Majjhima Nikaya 26, and we will start from the very beginning. Usually I make extracts, but now we're going to look at the full, pretty much a full sutta. Isn't that exciting, a full sutta? That's better, isn't it? You get the whole, <laughs> the whole thing here. So, uh, thus have I heard. This is a Bhikkhu Bodhi and Yanamoli translation of this particular sutta. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jeta's Grove, Anattapindika's Park. This is where the Buddha stayed most of the time. Then, when it was morning, the Blessed One robed up, he put on his upper robe, and taking his bowl and outer robe, he went into Savati for alms. Then a number of bhikkhus went to the Venerable Ananda and said to him, Fred Ananda, it is a long time since we heard a talk on the Dhamma from the Blessed One's lips. It would be good if we could hear such a talk, friend Ananda. So this is interesting. This is how you get to hear a Dhamma talk from the Buddha. You don't go to the Buddha himself directly. You go via the, uh, his agent. Yeah, the agent is Ananda. <laughs> It's just like the modern day, yeah, you use the agent to get there. So, um, um, so this is the standard opening uh, that we find everywhere in the suttas. Uh, yeah, the Buddha goes into Savati for arms. Uh, for those of you who have been to India, which is quite, uh, quite a few of you, uh, if you've been to Savati, you know what it looks like. Uh, you have another Pindikas Park on one side, and then very close by you have the city, you have the big mounds of earth and clay, which, uh, uh, which uh, are the limits of the city in those ancient times. And you can have a, get a feeling when you think back to that, how the Buddha would have walked from Antapindika's park into the city. Not so far, yeah, maybe a kilometer or so. Yeah, collect his arms and then go back again to the monastery, or maybe eat in the city somewhere, or something like that. Uh, so this is kind of, you get this feeling for how these things would work. Uh. It says here the Blessed One dressed, which is kind of not really the right way of putting it, because he had already dressed before, it's just that he, he kind of put on his upper robe yeah, at this particular time. Uh, and then he go into the city. Uh, so, and they ask the Ananda for to get a Dhamma talk from the Buddha. Then Ananda replies, then let the Venerable Ones go to the Brahmin Ramaka's hermitage, Perhaps you will get to hear a talk on the Dhamma from the Blessed One's own lips. Yes, friend, they replied. So here we have a Brahmin Ramakasa hermitage. And uh, I think this is the only place that he occurs in the suttas. I've never heard of him anywhere else. Uh, but it points to the fact that in those days the Brahmins had hermitages. They weren't just experts in rituals and that sort of thing, but they also had hermitages. And that means, of course, that the Brahmin tradition was more than just performing rituals and services for people and remembering the Vedas. The Brahmin tradition was also about meditation practice. The reason you have a hermitage is presumably because of that, yeah, in part. So it was quite, it was a very, already at that time, it was a uh, it, it, it was a fairly uh, broad idea, the idea of the Brahmin practice. And if you look at the Brahmin scriptures, uh, you have the Vedas, you have the Upanishads, and the Upanishads are scriptures uh, that are uh, 
that are mystic in the sense that they are about the practice of the spiritual path and the attainment of mystical states, like samadhi. Samadhi is what you call a mystical state, yeah? Because you are essentially leaving this world and entering something very different. That's why they're called mystical. And most traditions have a kind of mystical aspect to them, and this includes the Brahmins in this particular case. And this is uh, sort of interesting because later on uh, uh, we will see how the Buddha goes to Alara Kalama and Uddhakaramaputta, yeah, and he practices meditation under these meditation teachers. Uh, and very often the question is, who were these people? W what school did they belong to? What religion were they? Uh, and it seems quite possible that they were also Brahmins by birth, but they were Brahmins who practiced the spiritual life rather than just being ritual uh, Brahmins who did rituals and that sort of thing. Yeah. And uh, so the Brahmins, because the Brahmins actually did practice jhanas, yeah, that, that seems to have been, been fairly well known, uh, um, or at least something similar to the jhanas, maybe some kind of samadhi, uh, whereas many of the other traditions uh, or schools or, or religions in ancient India, they were more into ascetic practices and that sort of thing. Yeah. So that is just uh, you know, interesting for just to have some idea that the, the Buddha, he tried off and started off with the traditional teachings of Brahmanism and then he moved on from there. Yeah. Anyway, so yes friend they replied, then when the Blessed One had wandered for alms in Savati yeah, and had returned from his alms round after his meal, he addressed the Venerable Ananda. Ananda, let us go to the Eastern Park uh, uh, or the Eastern Monastery yeah, uh, to the stilt house of Visak Visaka. And Megara's mother, who is Visaka, for the day's abiding, or if you like, for the day's meditation. Pali word is Diva Vihara. Vihara in Pali has the idea of a monastery or an abiding, but it lit also refers to meditation practice. Diva is day, so the meditation for the day. Yeah. And often the Buddha, he would uh, meditate on compassion after the meal, that is mentioned a few places in the suttas, uh, the Maha Karuna. Yeah, the compassion for the whole world, uh, and I guess to get him, maybe to uh, to get inspired for maybe teaching or something like that. Uh. Anyway, so they go to the Eastern Park. If you think about, if you've been to Savati, you know that the Antapindika's monastery is on the western side of Savati, whereas this would have been on the eastern side, so opposite sides. Uh. Yes, Venerable Sir, the Venerable Ananda replied. Uh, then the Blessed One uh, went with the Venerable Ananda to the uh, Eastern Monastery, uh, to the stilt Visakas stilt house uh, for the day's meditation. Then, when it was evening, uh, the Blessed One rose from meditation and addressed the Venerable Ananda. Ananda, let us go to the Eastern bathing place to bathe. Yes, Venerable Sir, the Venerable Ananda replied. Then the Blessed One went with the Venerable Ananda to the eastern bathing place to bathe. When he was finished, he came out of the water and stood in one robe, drying his limbs. Then the Venerable Ananda said to the Blessed One, Hmm, Venerable Sir, the Brahmin Ramaka's hermitage is nearby. Uh, the hermitage is agreeable and delightful. Venerable, it would be good if the Blessed One went there out of compassion. The Blessed One consented in silence. This is how you get the Buddha to do something, yeah? <laughs> this is the trick. <laughs> it's kind of sweet, isn't it? You, you, you kind of put it very gently and you have to you do it in the, in the right way. And what is interesting about this, the first little point there, he says that it, the hermitage is agreeable and delightful. Huh? It's quite interesting, isn't it? Uh, you, it's, it's not as if, uh, you know, the, the Buddhism people are really tough and ascetic, so yeah, this place is really tough, it's just rocks and everything, uh, please come there. No, you go to a place that is agreeable and delightful. Uh, and of course, that reminds us of, in Buddhism, of the middle way. Uh, it is not about torturing ourselves, and we will see that later on. Uh, it's about doing something which is a uh, Nice, but not so nice that we indulge, but nice so as to be comfortable, so to be at ease. And the same is true for the Buddha. Yeah, go to a place that is at ease, not too luxurious, not kind of, uh, you know, really super duper, but just that middle way. And this is something you see throughout the suttas. We will see later on in the same sutta when the Buddha goes to find the place for striving for enlightenment, yeah, at what is now Bodhgaya. 
He goes to a place that is also delightful, with a beautiful river nearby where he can bathe and where he can drink or whatever, with a village at a convenient distance uh, yeah, nearby. Uh, yeah, so you have the village nearby. Here is very convenient. I live here, and I, the village is kind of three floors down. Yes, yeah, so I go there in the morning, and I get my candle meal. So this is very convenient. Uh, but in those days, you had to walk into the village that was nearby. Uh, and uh, so it is. you can see how uh, it, it, Buddhism is geared toward this middle way. It can be beautiful, especially nature can be beautiful, and this is not a hindrance. Why? Because nature, nature is naturally soothing. You don't really attach to nature just because it's beautiful. You tend more to feel at ease and relaxed. I live in my little kuti at Bodhidharma Monastery. When I live there, the, my only, the only beings around me are kangaroos. Yeah, okay, and, t and ticks and ants and that kind of stuff, yeah, they're also there, but I don't want to make it sound too kind of wonderful because reality is always, uh, <laughs> always complicated. Uh, and uh, this is the, uh, so this is an important point, and you will notice, like, little things like this are there in the suttas. It is this middle way approach, yeah, an approach where you neither at attach or you indulge, but nor do you do things that are unnecessary suffering, yeah? this kind of, where you are at ease, you are comfortable. Yeah? It reminds me now, well, I'm at it, it reminds me when I, uh, you know, when we, you go to Thailand and you visit some of these famous teachers, and one of those very famous teachers that I've talked about before, Ajahn Ganha in Thailand. You know Ajahn Ganha, Venerable? Huh? You know Ajahn? Yes? You know Ajahn Ganha? Never met him? Never met him? Okay, okay. Anyway, he's, very, he's a very nice monk, and a few years ago we had a large group of people from Perth. Yeah, and we, they, they, I wasn't with them, but they told, I told, heard a story afterwards. Uh, and they went to visit Ajahn Ganaha, Yeah, and they were all very excited. Yeah, now a real forest monk. Yeah, this is, these are the real kind of practitioners. Yeah, we, we kind of like the monks at Bodhinana Monastery, but now this may be, may be even better. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, so they went to Ajahn Ganna and they were going to ask him all these questions about meditation practice and metta and all of these things because uh, this is what he is very famous for. Some people say he's an arahant. I, I don't know if he's an arahant, I have no idea. It's very hard to know these things, but uh, maybe. And so um, they ask him, oh, please, you know, uh, uh, Ajahn or Lumpur or whatever they call him, I don't know. Then uh, what, can you please give us some, uh, uh, some inform can you please tell us how to do meditation practice? Uh, and uh, Ajahn Ganha, he is famous for not talking very much, uh, yeah? So he says, breathe in, sabai, breathe out, sabai. That was it. <laughs> and the, the group from Perth were like, what, is that it? <laughs> okay. But, but sabai in Pali means like to be at ease, to be comfortable, to be relaxed. That's what it means, yeah? It means, so this is kind of how you meditate. You are at ease, you are relaxed, you are comfortable. You are not super ascetic or super tough, nor do you indulge. You find that middle way. Uh, yeah, and this is exactly the same thing. You have to be at ease. If you're not at ease, uh, you won't succeed in your meditation practice. You won't succeed to attain happiness and joy because uh, the pain and the co discomfort will counteract the ability for you to feel happiness and, and be at ease in your meditation practice. Anyway, so, so that is what uh, this is about. Little things like that are actually quite, uh, quite interesting uh, when you see these things in the suttas. Uh. So, uh, and then of course he says it is agreeable and delightful. Then he says it would be good if the Blessed One went there out of compassion. Yeah, and this is the way to get a, um, the Buddha to teach, and I think it is the good, a good way to get anyone to teach who is a good Buddhist, yeah, is to say that, to, to, to um, ask for their compassion, because that is why someone who is well practiced should teach. They should teach out of compassion, not because of any ulterior motives, but simply to be helpful, uh, to do it out of kindness. That's why we should do these things. Uh, and the same is true of the Buddha. Uh, if you said to the Buddha, oh, please go and teach so that people can worship you or whatever, he might not be so impressed uh, because he knows that's not really the point. Uh, or go there so you can get a large donation. Uh, yeah, again, the Buddha probably wouldn't be so impressed with that. Uh, so he, he, you do it out of compassion. Uh. Okay, the blessed one consented in silence uh, or by silence. Uh. Then uh, the blessed one went to the Brahmin Ramaka's hermitage. Uh, 
Now on that occasion a number of bhikkhus were sitting together in the hermitage discussing the Dhamma. The Blessed One stood outside the door waiting for the discussion to end. When he knew that it was over, he coughed and knocked, and the bhikkhus opened the door for him. The Blessed One entered, sat down on a seat, made ready, and then addressed the bhikkhus. So, um, um, this is quite nice. Yeah, uh, When the bhikkhus are discussing the Dhamma, this is the Buddha, right? Uh, he doesn't just barge in and say, oh yeah, I am more important than your discussion or anything like that. Uh, he actually waits outside. Uh, he's a very, very, very polite and there's no kind of indication that you have some special entitlement or anything like that just because you are the Buddha. Sometimes you read the suttas and the Buddha seems much more humble than many modern day monastics. Uh, yeah, some of the modern day monastics take themselves much more seriously than, uh, than the Buddha did. Uh, and uh, you know, little things like in the suttas, the Buddha tends to wash his own feet, for example. Yeah, the Buddha, he, uh, he is given water, but he does washes his own feet. Uh, but these days, a, mo a lot of monastics, they get their feet washed by other people. Sometimes it happens to me too, yeah? Sometimes people want to wash my feet. I think, okay, <laughs> I don't know, but I feel a bit embarrassed because the Buddha washed his own feet and then someone washes my feet. Some, somehow it doesn't seem right. Uh, I feel a bit kind of embarrassed with that. Uh, but then I guess traditions change. Sometimes you just have to go with the flow. You don't have much choice sometimes. Uh, but uh, so this is interesting, yeah? The Buddha is quite low key. He's quite humble. He doesn't have any sense of self, of course. Uh, he waits outside, yeah? Again, very human, a very natural interaction between people. Not too much hierarchy, uh, more sense of equality, yeah? Which is great. And then you feel more like, a, it's almost perhaps you feel more like a, a, um, a brother with the Buddha, or maybe you feel like the Buddha is like your uncle or something like that. Uh, it's a close relationship uh, and not too hierarchical, uh, but, uh, uh, but at the same time a little bit of difference because uncle obviously is more, more senior. So it's not that tremendous gap between the top of the Sangha and the kind of ordinary people, uh, which is uh, which is fascinating, something that we, I think, ought to remember in the present day, when sometimes we find the distance between monastics and ordinary Buddhists, sometimes it's so huge, and it's kind of overly worshipping, and whatever you say, is regardless of whether you speak complete nonsense, people say, oh, sadhu, 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 venerable, how wonderful, but why does he say anything useful at all? Why are you saying sadhu for her? I, you know, sometimes... <laughs> I've seen this so many times, I think, oh, okay, whatever, <laughs> just go ahead and <laughs> go with the flow. So, and, and, and this is one thing I like about you know, living in the, in the West especially, and it also may be a little bit true here in Malaysia as well, but in the West, because Buddhism is new to the West, people don't let you off the hook quite so easily. <laughs> Yeah, so if you say something silly, they tell you, why are you saying this? This doesn't make any sense. Oh yeah, maybe you have a point, yeah. <laughs> and it make and the good thing about that, it makes you up your game a little bit. Yeah, you have to actually try a little bit harder to make sure that you say something useful, that you practice properly, you do the right thing. You're not kind of worship just because you're wearing a brown robe and you, you shave your head. That's not enough. There has to be a little bit more than that. So anyway, it's good to see this in the suttas as well. So the Buddha waits yeah, outside until the monks are finished. And then they open the door from him, then he comes in. And then he sits down on the seat made ready. So um, then he says to the, to the monks, Bhikkhus, for what discussion are you sitting together here now? And what was your discussion that was interrupted or left unfinished? Venerable Sir, our discussion on the Dhamma that was interrupted was about the Blessed One Himself. Then the Blessed One arrived. Good bhikkhus, it is fitting for you, clansmen, the Kula Putta, who have gone forth out of faith from the home life into homelessness to sit together uh, to discuss the Dhamma. When you gather together bhikkhus, you should do either either of two things, uh, hold discussion on the Dhamma or maintain noble silence. It's a very high standard, isn't it? <laughs> so, 
But uh, uh, it is uh, nice to be reminded of this, and uh, sometimes in this world, uh, even monks talk can talk too much, uh, and it's difficult to find that middle way often. Of course, it doesn't mean that we should be too silent. It's good to kind of be friendly as well, and the Buddha is often friendly in the suttas, and he exchanges friendly greetings. Uh, this is a standard introduction when people meet. Uh, so it, this is not shouldn't be taken too in a too absolute a sense, but uh, it, you, know, you should avoid all the worldly talk that is uh, actually mentioned elsewhere in the suttas. Uh. Anyway, so they are discussing the Buddha himself, and of course this is the background then for why the Buddha talks about his own life. And this is what is, comes up next here. Yeah. So now comes the Buddha's search for enlightenment. Because there are these two kinds of search, the noble search and the ignoble search. And what is the ignoble search? Here someone being himself subject to birth seeks what is also subject to birth. Being himself subject to old age, he seeks what is also subject to old age. Being himself subject to illness, he seeks what is also subject to illness. Being himself subject to death, he seeks what is also subject to death. Being himself subject to sorrow, he seeks what is also subject to sorrow. Being himself subject to defilement, he seeks what is also subject to defilement. This is called the ignoble search. And uh, you can imagine what it is, yeah, and, and it comes straight afterwards, what are these things that are subject to all of these things? And the answer is all the worldly things in the world. They are what are subject to these things. Yeah, and this is what the next paragraph says. And um, so let, let's just read it out. Uh, and what may be said to be subject to birth, old age, sickness, death, sorrow and defilement? I have contracted the passage a little bit. Uh, wife and children, yeah, or if you like, husband and children. Uh, in those days, everything was very male centric, but either way, are subject to all of these things. Yeah, birth, old age, illness, death, sorrow, and defilement. Uh, men and women, slaves. Uh, okay, yeah. Do any of you have slaves? Uh, probably, probably not. So this is probably not so not so relevant. Uh, uh, goats and sheep, figs, uh, fowl and pigs, uh, elephants, cattle, horses and mares, uh, gold and silver are subject to birth, old age, illness, maybe not illness in this case, but death, sorrow and defilement. Uh, these acquisitions, this ownership, yeah, these things uh, are subject to all of these uh, problems. Uh, and one who is tied to these things, infatuated with them, and utterly committed to them, being himself subject to all of these qualities, uh, seeks what is also subject to these things. This is the ignoble search. So uh, this is really fascinating. The Buddha already has this insight at a very early time in his life about two different kinds of search. Uh, and he understands that uh, the, almost everyone in the world does this kind of ignoble search. Yeah, to be a noble one is a very high bar to clear. Very difficult to be a noble person. Uh, because this is, if you look around, uh, and uh, it is true even of monastics to some extent, unless your meditation is going really well, uh, that is where you find your happiness, that is where you find your pleasures. Uh. So we seek these things. Yeah, we already have a problem in our own life. Uh. I'm going to die. I'm going to get ill and old. I hope I'm going to get old. Maybe I'm not. Who knows? But, you know, yeah, and all of these things. And then you go into the world and you seek a wife for yourself. You seek children. You seek all these possessions. And all of these things, too, have exactly the same problem. One day they're going to have to go. And of course, because you are seeking them, uh, you will attach to them. That's kind of the whole point of seeking these things, is because you want them. That's why you're going to attach to them. Uh, so you go out into the world, you seek all of these things, you attach to them. Uh, and, but then actually, be precisely because of that, you know down the road it's going to cause trouble for you, it's going to cause suffering, it's going to cause problem, because all of these things are going to have to go. Uh, so every time you seek for something, you look for something, uh, you're asking for suffering. Uh, that's what the Buddha is saying. Uh, 
So the Buddha, so here he is saying, why should I go into the world and ask for suffering? Why should I go and get all of these things that have the nature to always to disappear, to go? These things I cannot hold on to. Uh, when I already have a personal problem that is large enough, I'm seeking for more problems in the world. Uh, so this is what the Buddha is realizing here, and it is in many ways, it is so obvious. We can all see that to some extent, you know, all the things in our life, they're going to have to disappear one day, we know that. And yet for the Buddha to be here, uh, this has a very powerful impact. Uh, he understands this in a very, very deep way. Uh, and because he understands it in a very deep way, he is then moved onto the path of uh, searching for something else instead, searching for an end of these problems. Yeah? Instead, of search, instead of multiplying them, uh, he searches for an end of these problems. Uh. And this is one of the things that makes the Buddha to be so special, uh, is the fact that he has this audacity, he has this uh, belief in himself, that he just leaves the home life, yeah? wanders off into the jungle to find an answer to the problem of death. It's kind of astonishing. Yeah? Do you see that often here in Malaysia? People say, okay, I'm going to find the answer to the problem of death, and they walk out of KL into the jungle to find the... P it doesn't really happen very often, right? Uh, so it's kind of very audacious and very sort of uh, astonishing that people even do these things. Uh, of course, in those days it was easier, because in those days there already was an ascetic tradition. Uh, there were people already doing these kind of things, uh, so it was fairly natural for then someone like the Buddha to be to do this, uh, because the tradition was already established. Uh, but still, it is quite, uh, quite remarkable that someone does that simply based on this thing. Uh, and um, there's more, a little bit more on this afterwards, uh, uh, but uh, this is, of all of these things, uh, death is the big one, yeah? Illness, old age, birth, all these things, uh, death is really the big one among all of these things. Sorrow, defilements, uh, and really, uh, we saw that in the previous sutta as well, yeah? Death was one of the main things there. Uh, so it can be said that death is the thing that made the Buddha go forth. Uh, and that shows you a little bit of the power of the Marana Sati, the death contemplation. The Buddha went forth because of the reality of death. And by contemplating that fully and practicing accordingly, he became the Buddha on that basis. Yeah, this is how the Buddha arose, by reflecting on death. Yeah, death is what kind of made this whole Buddhist teaching arise in the world. But one person, two and a half thousand years ago, thinking in a very profound way about death, that is why we have Buddhism in the present day. Is that kind of astonishing? It seems like such a natural thing. And now, all of this enormous thing we call the Buddhist teaching, lasting for two and a half thousand years, still being, present in the, still being here in the present day, arose because of one person reflecting deeply on death. So who knows, maybe if, if one of us here uh, reflects deeply on death, you know, we will have another kind of cycle of Buddhism, uh, moving for another, uh, you know, uh, arising again in the future. Uh, it seems so simple, it's, it's so everyday thing, all of us know about death, uh, and yet we don't really know. We know, but we don't know. We see, but we don't see. Yeah, as we had it yesterday here. Uh, it's a superficial knowledge, uh, it's not really a profound knowledge, and that's why it doesn't have the same impact. But it shows you some of the potential for that simple reflection on death. If you do it fully, you do it well, wow, it is so powerful, uh, has such incredible potential. Uh, uh, for this simple reflection. So don't underestimate some of these things. Uh, they are, uh, or can be very powerful things. Uh, so, uh, <coughs> let us have a look at the noble search. And what is the noble search? Here's someone being himself subject to birth, uh, having understood the danger in what is subject to birth. Uh, he seeks the Freedom from birth, yeah, the unborn really here just means the freedom from birth, the supreme security from bondage, or the, the rest from exertion is another way of looking at that. Yeah? We keep on exerting ourselves to get somewhere, striving, 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 and one day we can chillax uh, yeah, and just sit back and relax and, and uh, enjoy the fruit of our labor. Yeah? Nibbana, if you like, extinguishment. Yeah, this is the real meaning of nibbana, extinguishment. Being 
uh, oneself subject to old age, having understood the danger in what is subject to old age. He seeks the uh, freedom from old age, the supreme security from bondage or the rest from exertion, uh, extinguishment. Being himself subject or themselves subject to uh, sickness, having understood the danger in what is subject to sickness, he seeks the freedom from sickness, uh, the supreme uh, security from bondage, extinguishment. Being himself subject to death, uh, having understood the danger in what is subject to death, uh, he seeks the freedom from death, uh, the supreme uh, uh, release, or the supreme rest from exertion, uh, extinguishment. Uh, being himself subject to sorrow, having understood the danger in what is subject to sorrow, he seeks the freedom from sorrow, the supreme security from bondage, extinguishment, being himself subject to defilement, having understood the danger in what is subject to defilement, uh, he seeks the freedom from defilement, supreme security from bondage, extinguishment. Uh, this is the noble search. So you have understood that it is danger, yeah? especially death is problematic. Danger here mean, just means that it will lead to suffering. That's what it means. Uh, yeah, that's why it is a danger. So you, you get that uh, and then you search for your happiness somewhere else where it is more realistic. Yeah. That is really what that says. Uh, this is the noble search. Um, okay, let's, let's look at the next paragraph here as well because it's the Buddha then talking about him. This is just the theory. yeah. And um, what is interesting about this that we have looked at now, really remember that this is really in many ways part of the idea of right view. Yeah, and this is why the Buddha now decides to go forth, because right view, as I mentioned yesterday, is at the base of all the practice. Uh, look at the Noble Eightfold Path, it starts off with Samaditi, with right view, and uh, nothing really happens without right view. So this is kind of the right view of the Buddha that you see, or not the Buddha, the Buddha to be, yeah, that you actually see in this particular case. Uh, so he starts to look at the world in the, in the, with clarity, with clear eyes. Uh, and um, uh, this particular right view is really is related to the idea of impermanence, yeah? anicca, the understanding how impermanent everything is, uh, how unreliable it is. Anicca is, is nice to translate in different ways, unreliable, uncertain, unsteady, yeah? out of control, quite literally out of control. You cannot control the world. Things are going to die whether you want to or not. Things are always going to let you down. The Buddha realizes these, these, all of these things will let me down eventually. How can I attach to something that, that can let me down? It's like having a good friend who is unreliable. Yeah? And you are attached to this friend and every time they are unreliable they kind of they disappoint you. Yeah, because of their unreliability and uh, because you are attached to something which is unreliable. And that is madness to be attached to something which is unreliable and yet that's what everyone does. Yeah, unless you're an arahant, unless you're fully enlightened. Uh, so this is what the Buddha's right view. He starts to understand about anicca, the three characteristics of existence. And because things are anicca, they are dukkha as well. They are problematic. Uh, and then instead of searching for that, uh, he looks for happiness somewhere else. Uh, it's such a beautiful and simple thing. And if you look uh, at the world around us, uh, it is one of those very significant investigations about the world to see how impermanent it is. Uh, I don't know if you read the news or you look at the news, I'm sure some, all of you probably do that sometimes, uh, and sometimes you look at the news about the world and this is uh, the feeling you have, the world is out of control. Uh, is that the feeling you get sometimes when you re read about the news? You, you don't know what's going to happen next. Yeah? Sometimes you, you get, you know, you, the, sometimes the environment seems to be not doing too well. You find all this plastic in the oceans everywhere. You, you know, and and uh, who knows what's going to happen next to this world. You get all these politicians who are really kind of nationalistic. Yeah, our nation is better. Yeah, all these other, and they kind of, you kind of almost as if they're building up for the next war. That's kind of the feeling you get sometimes with this kind of politics around the world. And everything seems so 
uncertain, unreliable. And every time you watch the news and you feel you get upset about something, you get a little bit angry or you feel concerned or you get anxious about something, remember the reason why you get upset, the reason why you get anxious about what's happening in the world is that you are expecting the world to do one thing but the world is doing something else. You get angry because you are expecting the politicians to be sensible. Yeah, well actually politicians are just human beings and sometimes you have the wrong politicians in charge and sometimes you get people like Donald Trump yeah, to be the politician, the, the president of the biggest, most powerful country in the world and then you look at him you wonder, should he, is it a good idea to have someone like, like president? Maybe, <laughs> I don't know, I, I don't want really to talk politics but you know, to me I wonder whether, certainly when I, I, some people support Donald Trump and that's fine but if you don't support him you feel a bit anxious, yeah, we think, whoa, what is he going to do? Is he going to start a war? Or what, is he, what is he up to, this fellow? And then you kind of get a bit concerned about that but you realize the reason why why you are concerned is because you are taking refuge in that world. You have expectations of that world, but you cannot have expectations of the world outside. As soon as you have expectations of the world outside, you're going to be disappointed. It's going to let you down. So watch your reaction to the events in the world yeah, and see how you react. And if you are co completely equanimous, uh, then probably you have understood anicca on a very deep way. You expect the world to do strange things. You expect it to be out of control. You expect it to go different ways than what you would wish it to do. Uh, yeah, And then you have the right understanding of the world. Uh. So this is, in a sense, everything is out of control. This is what the Buddha is saying here. Uh. But of course, it's not just about the world outside, it's also about our belongings, our own, our own, own little world, yeah? our family, our belongings, the areas where we think that we are supposed to have control, but you don't even have control there. That there too, it is going to be problematic. Those things too are going to go differently from what you want them to do. Would you like to see your relatives get old and sick and die? We don't really want that. Yeah, if we, if we would want our relatives to be healthy and happy and stay young if possible, but it can't be done. It's impossible. And because we attach to the things around us, just as we attach to the ideas of the world, we attach more to the things around us, then we suffer when these things change. There is no uh, choice in the matter. So all the external things in our life, whether it is the big world around us uh, or it is the kind of more things that are immediate to us, our belongings, our friends, our family, our possessions, our status, our education, our intelligence. Yes, one day sometimes you lose your intelligence, you think I'm getting more stupid. Uh, and you think, wow, that's scary, I don't want to be more stupid. Or sometimes you lose your wisdom, that's even worse. Uh, I'm getting less wise. Uh, that is really scary. Uh, and uh, all of these things are unreliable, but especially the external things around us. Wisdom is a bit more reliable because you can build it up. Uh, but all the external things around us in the world are unreliable. Uh, because they are unreliable, they are eventually going to lead to suffering. Uh, you can't control them, and yet that's exactly what we try to do. Every time you attach to something, you are saying, I want to control this. You think you, have, you think you can control it. Attachment always leads to control, because you have a vested interest in those things. But you can't control it. So there's a direct clash there between how you would want the world to be and what the world actually is like. And the more you get this, the more you withdraw, and the more you move towards that inner uh, uh, inner refuge inside of us uh, where actually we have some control. Yeah, our inner life there is some control because uh, uh, we can decide whether how to live, uh, whether with kindness or not and all these kind of things, uh, but the external life always is problematic. And this is the sort of thing that the Buddha is realizing here. Yeah, All these external things, they are subject to unreliability, therefore ultimately there will be dukkha. This is right view in a certain way. Uh, this is the right attitude towards the world. And what you will notice is that if you take that view on board, it changes your priorities. It changes what is important to you. It changes where you seek for real happiness. It doesn't mean that you become callous and don't care for others. Actually, you care more for others uh, because you understand the fragility of the world. Uh, you become more compassionate because you understand the suffering of other people as well. Uh, so actually, it develops your heart. Uh, it makes you a better person as a consequence. Uh, so um, 
This is, a, a, this is a, one of those things, yeah? Simple things. And this is what I mean by the idea of brainwashing. You read this, yeah? And you think, it's true. And because it's true, you, you become brainwashed. Yeah? You allow those ideas to go into you because you know it's true. So of course you have to al allow these ideas, otherwise you'd be crazy if you kind of shut them out. But uh, this, so, so you, you know, and then gradually, gradually, you hear these teachings and they have this powerful effect on you. It moves you in a different direction. You start to look at the world in a different way. Your life in a new way and your priorities change, your values change, and uh, you become a far better person as a consequence. So let's have a look at how this uh, affects the Buddha because uh, now he has kind of set the theory, the right view, and then we have this little passage here. Because uh, before my awakening, uh, yeah, this is uh, uh, awakening I think is better than enlightenment, while I was still only an unawakened bodhisattva. I too, being myself subject to birth, uh, sought what was also subject to birth. Yeah, the Buddha had a son and he had a wife, presumably, and all of that. Uh, so he too was kind of doing what everyone else was doing. Uh, being myself subject to old age, sickness, death, sorrow, and defilement, uh, I sought what was also subject to old age, uh, sickness, death, sorrow, and defilement. Uh, then I considered thus. Uh, why, being myself subject to birth, do I seek what is also subject to birth? Why, being myself subject to old age, sickness, sorrow, death and defilements, do I seek what is also subject to all these things? Suppose that being myself subject to birth, having understood the danger in what is subject to birth, again, I seek the freedom from birth, the supreme security from bondage, extinguishment. Uh, suppose that being myself subject to old age, sickness, death, sorrow and defilements, uh, having understood the danger in all of these things, uh, I seek the freedom from all of these things, uh, the freedom from old age, from uh, sickness, from death, from sorrow and from defilements, uh, the supreme rest from exertion, uh, uh, Nibbana, extinguishment. Uh, so the Buddha, basically now he decides to become a monastic. This is what this is about. This is the thinking that leads up to him becoming a monastic. Yeah? Death being the primary driver, but all of these things being part of the suffering of humanity. You are sick again today and it's to be expected. Sickness is part of life and that is one reason why life sometimes is dukkha and it's suffering. Yeah? But just very briefly, I always like to comment on the beginning there, especially for those of you who haven't been on these retreats before. At the very beginning of that passage it says, Before my awakening, while I was still only an unawakened bodhisattva. So, what is, what is this all about? Bodhisattva? Isn't Bodhisattva's Mahayana Buddhism? Or is this, is this some kind of Mahayana intrusion into the suttas? have the Mahayanist kind of copied in the word there, sneaking in a word to kind of make the Mahayana suit as more authentic. Is that what's happening here? Are we some kind of a dodgy Mahayana monk maybe coming and adding <laughs> a word? And no, that is, that is not what is going on. What is going on? This actually is probably an authentic part of this sutta. So what we need to understand then is what does Bodhisattva mean? in the early suttas. And this is what is interesting. It actually has a quite a different meaning in the early suttas uh, compared to later on within the Mahayana tradition and all of that. Uh. And uh, if you look at the way the word bodhisattva or bodhisattva in Sanskrit, uh, how it is used uh, in the early suttas, it really seems to be used only, almost exclusively for the time after the Buddha goes forth from home, from home into homelessness uh, until he reaches a awakening. Uh, yeah, that is the time when the Buddha is a bodhisattva. So, what does, what is the meaning of this word bodhisattva? And in Sanskrit, bodhisattva is often translated as an awakening being. Bodhi means awakening. It's uh, similar to the word Buddha. These words are, are closely related to each other. And sattva is 
being. So it is often said to be an awakening being, which is kind of slightly strange. Awakening being is kind of a strange word, uh, but uh, actually, it quite likely, it means something else. And the meaning may very well be derived from the Sanskrit bodhisattva. And bodhisattva means to be intent, someone who is intent or searching for awakening. Yeah? And then it starts to make really good sense, yeah? Because of course the moment the Buddha leaves the home life, it is precisely because he's searching for awakening. He is intent on awakening. He's going on this uh, 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 search for the freedom, the liberation from all the problems. Uh, and uh, actually there is a, the new translation by Ajahn Sujato, who is uh, one of my kind of colleagues, he's Australian monk. Yeah. Do, do you know Adan Sujato? Have you heard about him? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he has this a very quite nice website that he has built up called Sutta Central, and it is becoming maybe the leading website in the world for early suttas. Maybe it's actually a very nice, very good website. And uh, he, there also you find his translation. He has translated all the four Nikayas from Pali into English there, and he translates uh, this as uh, what does he translate as uh, aspiring for awakening, something like that. Is that what he has? Uh, intent on awakening. Okay, that's what he has. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you have you have direct access there. there. Okay, good. Oh, uh, you have it. His translations there. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Okay, download it. Okay. So intent on awakening. That's what he has. Uh, yeah. And this is what is there. So it really refers to that. And uh, um, why? So and of course later on it started. To, this idea started to expand. Yeah. Later on, uh, in Theravada Buddhism itself, the idea became that the Buddha had already become a bodhisattva many eons ago when he decided to, you know, to pursue the path to become a, a Buddha in the future and all of that. And suddenly this idea of bodhisattva expands out. Originally, it probably just meant from the time he left the home life in this life, his last life, and then it expands out and becomes this cosmic thing of this of this person searching for awakening over uh, vast uh, expanses of time. But that is a later development. Uh, it doesn't really belong in the early suttas. Uh, it is not just Mahayana, it is also found in Theravada, but not in the suttas, more in the commentaries and in the later development of, of these things. Uh, the important, uh, important point to understand, and, and a, a large Part of the reason why these ideas were developed was, I think, uh, after the Buddha passed away, people were feeling there was an emptiness in their life. Yeah, imagine when the Buddha passes away. It's quite traumatic. Yeah, this towering figure who is the leader of all the Buddhas, who started all of this. Whenever you have a question, you go to the Buddha. Now this person is gone. You feel like lost. You feel like, don't know, what, what do we do now? Yeah, it's like, don't know what to do. And it, it, because it's like uh, Bodhinyana Monastery, Ajahn Brahm dies. I don't know what's going to happen. Bodhinyana Monastery, <laughs> if he dies, uh, yeah, it's going to be dramatic. Yeah. <laughs> but the Buddha, even much more, much more so, yeah, is really kind of big when the Buddha passes away. Uh, and um, we see that happening around the world. We can see that in very worldly things. In Thailand, for example, when the Thai king died a couple of years ago. It was a big traumatic for the Thai people, yeah, because he was so beloved by the Thai people that when he died, it was like, oh no, what are we going to do now? We kind of feel our father is gone. Yeah, don't know what to do. <laughs> don't know what to do anymore. So with the Buddha, of course, even more so because he was even more powerful, even more pure, even more, even more reliable, even you know, had all of these qualities. Uh, and then what happens because of that, because of that vacuum, that uh, lack of uh, someone to uh, look to, they start to build up the stories. Uh, yeah? And you see that already happening in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, uh, the, the story of the Buddha's final days is passing away. We'll have a look at that later on, uh, where the stories start to become very powerful, more and more miracles, uh, more and more weird things happening. Uh, and all of that really are just stories. That it, it doesn't look like they really happened. And this is an important point to see, because when you, again, you do comparative study between these various suttas, uh, there's so much divergence in these miracles that uh, you, it look, it's almost impossible that they could be real and actually happened. Uh, it is more a story that was told after the Buddha passed away. Uh, and the further in time you move away from the Buddha, the more wild, I shouldn't say wild, the more incredible, <laughs> 
the more incredible the stories become and, and the Buddha becomes something completely different. He goes from being a human being to becoming something very different from the rest of us until eventually he ends up be, being the cosmic principle and all of these kind of things. And, uh, you know, and this is what we see happening in Theravada, in Mahayana, across Buddhism. We see this development happening here. And this is why it is so wonderful to be able to go back to the early suttas and try to actually see what was the original meaning of a Buddha. What was the Buddha really about? And this is what we are trying to do here. We're trying to kind of find out who the Buddha was. And hopefully already you're getting a little bit of feeling for the Buddha. And to me it is quite a beautiful to have that natural picture of the Buddha, a proper understanding of who he was. And that is the meaning of Bodhisattva. Uh, Bodhisattva in the early suttas. So uh, he was still about, he was still searching for awakening, yeah, and he understood all the problems again. With I've just mentioned this before, he was starting to understand anicca, and because of anicca, he was understanding dukkha, and he was lost interest in the home life, despite the fact that he lived in quite a lot of luxury. We saw that before. He had access to all the pleasures of life that was available at that time, and yet he realized it is all hollow. It is all dangerous, because ultimately all those pleasures will turn into pain. They will turn into dukkha and uh, I will not be able to hold on to it. Uh, there must be something more important in life, something better, uh, something, and that is what he is now going out to seek. So, uh, I will stop there. It's a good place to stop. So let's have a short break uh, and we'll uh, continue at uh, 9.30. Uh, okay. <laughs>